the truth, and nothing but the truth. This is GBN, the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Then we shall rise on that resurrection morning when death's prison bars are broken. We shall rise. We shall rise. Welcome again to Counterpoint. I'm Mike Hickson. With me today, B.J. Clark. B.J., it's always good to be with you and to talk about Scripture. My pleasure. B.J., today we talk about the theme, God will forgive you. I think that there are probably a lot of folks that have bought into the concept that has been spun by the devil that God really doesn't care whether you're saved or lost. How do you counter this idea that God isn't really that interested in you as a human being? From Genesis to Revelation, God makes it clear on the canvas of Holy Scripture that He loves men. He loves the sinner. He wants to save us. And uh, there's nothing we've done that God would not be willing to forgive if we're willing to uh, repent and to do what He's asked us to do. Think about it. Mike, just cut right to the, the most unbelievable part of this. The very same people that killed His Son, mm -hmm. Peter said, You with wicked and lawless hands have crucified and slain the Son of God, Acts chapter 2. And then the same group, He tells if you'll call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. But then he tells that same group how to call on the name of the Lord, 17 verses later, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. You mean to tell us that we can kill the very Son of God, shed His blood, and still be forgiven by God? Yes. That is what I'm telling you. What's a marvelous thought. B.J., I, I know that there are probably some people who are watching, and, and I know that you citing Acts chapter 2 probably very helpful to them because in their heart of hearts, they're thinking, you know what, you, you just have no idea what I've done right. or, or where I've been. And, and there are some people that they, they feel as if they are so mired in a life of sin that there is no way God could forgive them or would forgive them. And, and I guess in, in short, they feel beyond the scope of human redemption. What, what would you say to somebody like that? Uh, you know, I would try to point them to those passages like uh, 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ, this is a faithful saying, it's worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm chief, Paul wrote. Paul is the chief of sinners in his mind as he labeled himself, <clears throat> knew that he could still be forgiven. He reveled in that forgiveness, rejoiced in it, was amazed by it. I, I remember a lady saying to me some years ago when I was in Bible study with her, she said, but preacher, you don't know what I've done. If you knew what I'd done, you wouldn't be studying with me. And I said, I don't have to know what you've done. God knows already. But she then volunteered. She said that she had worked in the adult nightclub scene and was, she said, how many marriages have I helped to destroy by provoking and contributing to the lusts of the flesh? And she said, I, I just, I, I can't look at myself in the mirror. And I said, well, here's the good news. David, David committed adultery with Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. That's not a good thing. He then conspired to murder her husband. That's obviously a horrible thing. And yet that same man, David, who had been involved in adultery and murder, said, have mercy upon me, Psalm 51. That's right. And you remember in those beautiful texts, he says, <laughs> you know, cleanse me from my wickedness, it's a, it's a gorgeous text of Scripture. It really is. It really is. And, and you know, in that same context, he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And, and, and you know, B.J., I get it, that, that guilt can be a horrible thing. And, and, you know, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 13, the way of the transgressor is hard. And, and there are a lot of consequences associated with sin, one of which is this, this feeling of hopelessness and helplessness. 
Sin will break you down. It promises you liberty. It gives you slavery. It uh, makes you a, a slave to a certain lust of the flesh and then promises, oh, this will fulfill you. It'll fill you full. And what did Eve find out and Adam, who was with her, find out in the garden that for all the promise that uh, that forbidden fruit held to them when they were considering whether to eat it or not, the decision that was made led to irreversible consequences as far sure, as yeah. <clears throat> certain things in their lives. And sin never does give you the reality of what it promises. It, it takes you, as someone wrote, it takes you further than you ever th wanted to go, keeps you longer than you ever wanted to be kept. That's right. It's, it's a taskmaster. Yeah, you know, Jesus said in John chapter 8, I think in verse 34, whoever commits sin is the servant, the bondservant of sin. But then he goes on to say, but if the Son makes you free, you're free indeed. I think about what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 2 when he talked about people who are taken captive by the devil to do his will. And, and really, as you said a moment ago, sin imprisons people. And, and you know, the devil wants you to think that, you know, you've, you've got liberty, you can do what you want. But really what, what they are, as Paul points out in Romans chapter 6, look, you are a slave of unrighteousness. And sin is a terrible taskmaster. Right. Sin, it binds people, it blinds them to, to truth and to, uh, you know, to, to things that are good and right and holy. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. You mentioned the Garden of Eden. The devil sold Eve a bill of goods that was false to the core. He's been doing that since Ex the very beginning uh, of creation. And, and he's the master of it. You think about the addictions that some people are battling, some probably watching this very program are battling addiction and they got into this, not deliberately, no one wakes up one morning and says, you know what, I think I'll become a drug addict. <laughs> I think I'll become addicted to alcohol or cocaine or heroin or whatever the substance might be. I think I'll do that. How does it start? It starts with the promise of a temporary pleasure Oh, this won't hurt me. It can't hurt me. It will give me more pleasure than it will give me pain. But then they end up finding out. They said, oh. you know what? I'm now uh, chasing a temporary pleasure, but the majority of my life is pain. Oh. It is pain. It is pain and more pain. The good news is ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You can actually be freed from the bondage that uh, Satan and others have, you know, volunteered to step into. Yeah, I, I want us to go back to that freedom in Christ in just a minute. You, you mentioned the Apostle Paul, and, and when Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 1 that he was the chief of sinners, kind of the poster boy or poster child of sin. And, you, you know, if anyone could have empathized with people living in sin, I think Paul would have been that person. Mm -hmm. And when I look at his travels and his preaching and teaching, what, what strikes me, Paul didn't write people off and say, you know what, they wouldn't be interested. For example, when he went to the city of Corinth, Corinth was <laughs> steeped in idolatry, immorality, and, and yet he spent 18 months there and, and did some of his best work in, in, in a city that was so mired in sin and unrighteousness. And, and maybe if you would, talk about 1 Corinthians chapter 6 because I mean, these were people that, I mean, bottom line, man, they were, their, their lives were out of control. There is, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, this statement uh, in verse 9 beginning, he talks about, he says, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he starts enumerating some of the folks that he's talking about. He, he talks about everything from homosexuality to drunkards, thieves, covetous, extortioners. He just goes on and down and gives a laundry list of things sure does. and then says, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, <laughs> you are sanctified, you are, you know, set apart through Jesus Christ and the Spirit of the Lord Jesus. You've been forgiven and cleansed, you've been washed. Now think about this, 
I used to be this, but I'm now this. And how come? By the power of the blood of Christ. It's a, it's right. a wonderful, wonderful thing. You, you know, B.J., in, in, his, in his second letter, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 17, Paul said, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He said, All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And you mentioned the fact that they had been washed, the new birth. The new birth affords us a new beginning. And, and you know, if you were to ask people today, you remember Nicodemus, when Jesus said, Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus thought he was talking about a physical birth. He said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? How many people in the world today do you think if you could say, would you like the chance to start over? Mm. How many people, how many people do you think that would appeal to? Christianity is sometimes <laughs> called the land of beginning again. Yeah. And there's a, a beauty to that. And think about the prodigal. He got himself in such a mess that though at first everything looks so glamorous out there in the far country, he ends up waking up with no friends. He's lost and squandered all of the wealth that his father bequeathed upon him. And now he's in a, a pig pen. And for a Jewish boy represented in the parable mm -hmm. to be connected to animals that were considered unclean by them right. would be the lowest depth of depravity for them. So <clears throat> he's really in a mess. He's in a terrible mess. What does he do? Does he say, I have no options? No. He said, I will arise. I'll go to my father. I'll say, I have sinned. I'm no right. more worthy to be called your son. And just throw himself on the mercy of his father. And what does the story show us? God will forgive you because when that prodigal came over the horizon, the father was looking for him. He right. must have been looking for him on a regular basis. And perhaps, as I heard one preacher say years ago when I was a boy listening to him preach, when he saw him and saw his tattered clothes and condition, he might have thought, well, that's, that's not my boy. My boy doesn't look like that. But wait a minute, that is him. He runs to meet him. Mm -hmm. He doesn't run to slap him in the face and say, how dare you reproach our family like this. He runs to meet him, kisses him up and down in the sense of fatherly embrace. <clears throat> and he is willing to forgive him That's right. and give him a brand new start. It says, bring the best robe, a ring, a fatted calf, shoes on his feet. It's, it's a wonderful, you, beautiful scene. You know, BJ, you, know, you just triggered a thought in my mind, and that is in, I think in verse 17, Jesus said about that, pair, about that prodigal son, he came to himself. You know, it might be somebody that, that could be watching right now, and that light pops off and they think, you know what, that could be me. You, you know, I could have this fresh start. And, right. and, you know, we talk about the new birth and, a new beginning, and, and I would add to that new blessings. Yes. I mean, look at, you know, he left home with a pocket full of money, and he sees the bright lights, and man, I'm going to go out and have a big time. And, and what, what he leaves for, it doesn't work out the way he envisioned. And, and so he comes home, and, and look at how the Father lavishes blessings on him. And, and, you know, all the blessings that we enjoy in Christ, you mentioned a moment ago that the people in Corinth, Paul said, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. Maybe, maybe talk a little bit about the pardon that we enjoy in Christ. Because I mentioned a moment ago, I wanted us to come back to liberty. The Hebrew writer said, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sins and their iniquities, I will remember no more. That's hard for us to envision, that there is a God in heaven that will not only forgive us, but that he will say, you know what, all that in the past, I'm not bringing it up anymore. That's right. The uh, word justified, we've often kind of done a little play on that word to indicate the very thing you just mentioned. When God forgives, it's just as if I'd never sinned. That's amazing that he could blot it out to the degree of never holding it against me. We tend to file away things that people have done yes, to injure and hurt us in case we ever need to bring them up again. Don't get too arrogant because I'll just remind you of what that thing you did to me. 
God, when he forgives, he forgets. Yes, he and does. he puts it out of his, it's not as if he divinely does not know we did something, but he divinely chooses not to hold us, Account. hold that against us in any way, shape, or form. That's right. He has no memory of it against us. It's not on our record. It's expunged, you might say, yeah, that's uh, right. from the record by the blood of Christ. And what a glorious thought that is to know that I, no matter what I feel ashamed of having done in my life, I can know that God's willing to wipe it out and not remember it against me anymore. You know, B.J., that's an awesome thought. And, and add to that, again, we think about Paul, and, and Paul knew something about sin. And, and Paul enjoyed pardon. As a matter of fact, Ananias told him, Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins. The very, the very person who knew something about pardon also knew something and wrote about peace. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, he said, Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And Paul not only talked about his peace with God, but he said he had the peace that passes all understanding. Yeah. B.J., can't people today, if, if they will turn to the Lord, can't they experience that same peace? <laughs> There's no better way to sleep at night than to sleep in the peaceful knowledge that you are in Christ and Christ is in you. Paul, as you noted, uh, after he saw the Lord on the road to Damascus, he wasn't yet at peace. He now knew, hey, wait a minute, if he's really the Christ, and he is, I've been persecuting followers of the one true Christ, the Messiah, I've been persecuting the church, and that church is the body of Christ. And that's why Jesus has said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Saul was persecuting Christians, and yet Jesus said, you're persecuting me. That's right. Now, they would be called Christians in Acts 11, but they were followers of Christ even before that name was officially given. And Paul was persecuting them, and what? He couldn't eat. Uh, he was in anguish. He couldn't. He, he couldn't get any relief until Ananias showed up and said, right. what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on that's the right. name of the Lord. And that's when Paul had peace. He, he did. And, and you know, B.J., uh, you, you know, we just, it's, it's really almost like building upon, really building blocks, I guess, in a way. But I, I think about the new blessings that we enjoy, the, the, the pardon the peace. And, and you know, you look at the life of Paul and you think, you know, you know, just because we become a Christian doesn't mean that we're immune to trial and trouble and temptation and difficulties in life. And Paul became a great evangelist, a missionary, and he did tremendous good in his lifetime. But <clears throat> I think one of the things that would have added peace to his life was knowing that he had the presence of God in his life. I mean, you think about as a believer, we're never alone. I think about David saying on one occasion in Psalm 142, he said, no one cares for my soul. Paul, you remember on one occasion said, you know, at my first offense, no man stood with me. All men forsook me. But, but he didn't just stop there. And, and, and because he said, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. And, and BJ, don't we need the presence of God in, in life today? It's so wonderful. What did the Lord tell his apostles he said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm with you. That, in fact, Hebrews chapter 13 contributes to that same statement from Matthew 28. In Hebrews 13, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, this fictitious poem called Footprints in which this man uh, looks over the course of his life and in the most difficult times of his life, he notices that the two sets of footprints that he had seen in the sand have now turned into one during his most difficult hours. And he assumes that Jesus just abandoned him during those most difficult hours. And Jesus explains in the fictitious yeah. poem, no, it wasn't that I abandoned you, it was then that I carried you. Mm -hmm. And there's a sense in which, figuratively speaking, but actually, providentially, God is there to help me through the difficult hours of life. And, and He's still there to be, to be available, casting all my care upon Him That's because right. He cares for me, 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. And, and B.J., don't you love 
the Hebrew writer in chapter 13 when he said, speaking on behalf of God, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And, and the fact that, you know, in Psalm 139, the psalmist talked about the fact that God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. And to think there's nowhere that we can go mm -hmm. and escape His presence. And, and we don't want to escape His presence right. because we want to bask in His presence day by day and, and to know. And, and, you know, as a Christian, again, we, we think about all these great new blessings that we enjoy. The privilege of prayer, you mentioned a moment ago, uh, casting all our cares on, on Him because He cares for us. What a blessing to be able to, to approach the throne of God. I mean, can you imagine, could you imagine having in your pocket or in your cell phone uh, the number of the president or, or some powerful person in, in America or around the world, in, in the world that, that could immediately help you or, or listen to you and give you counsel and, and encourage you but we have, we have a Father that we can go to 24-7. And, and we're not going to get a busy signal. We're not going to be put, you know, it's not going to go automatically to voicemail. He's going to listen to us. Paul was imprisoned when he wrote Philippians. And he said in chapter 4, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And he makes a statement in verse 5 of that text, the Lord is at hand. Yep. Now, what does that mean? Some commentators say that uh, Paul thought the second coming was about to happen at any minute, and he was erroneously writing that he thought the Lord was. No, no. I remember when I was growing up and I'd get sick, my mom's nearness was a comfort to me. That's right. I, she'd bring me the chicken noodle soup, uh, tuck me in give me the castor oil or whatever she thought was hmm. going to make me feel better. But then I remember her walking away and saying, son, if you need anything at all, I'm right here. That nearness communicated a sense of warmth and comfort to me. Right. And I know that God is near us. He's with us in the darkest hours. Uh, you ever go to one of those caverns where they get you in there and they turn the lights out? Yeah. Uh, our youngest, our only child at the time was a toddler when that happened. And when they turned the lights out, he did not like it one bit. Uh, he screamed and wailed and shrieked. And I just reached for him in the dark and found him, picked him up and holding him. And the lights aren't out all that long, but in his mind, I'm sure it seemed like an eternity. But I'm patting him on the back and I said, it's okay, it's all right, I'm here, I'm okay. He starts, he starts calming down even though it's still dark. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that made him shriek in terror is still there, but he's not as terrified. Why? That's right. He's in his father's arms and he knows he's got me. And God cares about us and has us in his divine hand well, of providence. That, that's right. And, and I think that's a wonderful story that, that I think illustrates the fact that, uh, that, that we have that same comfort in, in uh, God the Father. BJ, what about the promise of life beyond this life? Mm. You, know, uh, you know, there are a lot of people that, you know, they think about their broken life and, and their sin, their unrighteousness, and, and the whole idea of enjoying forgiveness and peace and, I mean, but, but then to think about, you mean to tell me that God would, would give me a place with Him in heaven? And He will. Yeah. And, and, you know, this isn't just pie in the sky stuff. This is real. And, and, and so, as a, as a, you know, John said that this is the promise He's promised us, eternal life. So what about that hope of heaven? It's the very thing that keeps us going on days that aren't so good. It's the thing that keeps us going when we buried a loved one in Christ. Uh, it's the thing that, you know, Paul writes in Titus chapter 1 in hope of eternal life. And look, let's face it, and I'm not trying to be morbid here when I say this, but I look, I realize as I think about it sometimes, I have likely lived more years than I have left to live on this planet, 
and I see my grandchild growing up and see the time that I want to spend with my wife and I see all these things and life is passing by so rapidly and sometimes I want to slow it down. Yeah. Slow it down. Here's the good news. I'm going to be okay because there is life beyond this life. This is not the end. It is a means to an end. Yeah. <clears throat> Jesus Christ left and he went to heaven and he's coming back and he's going to take me to live with him someday and with all who've died in Christ. And so no matter what kind of blue day I may be having, yeah. I can recognize, you know what, in Christ I'm fine. If I die of an aneurysm I don't even know I have in the next 10 seconds, I'm okay. If he comes and blares that trumpet and he's coming back in the next 10 seconds, I'm okay because I'm in Christ. 1 John 2, 25, uh, make it verse 28. And now little children abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence before him and not be ashamed at his coming. Uh, that's a wonderful thought is that I can anticipate a second coming, not dread it. That's, that's great. BJ, we've got about two minutes left. To those who may be watching who feel like they're beyond hope. What, what do you say to encourage them and to get them where they need to be? I'd say look to the cross and watch the blood dripping from your Savior's brow. Watch the blood dripping from His head, His hands, His feet. And as it pools beneath the cross and you see it pooling there, recognize that's for you. That's because He loves you. And that blood is so powerful, it can cleanse you, wash you, sanctify you, justify you, and make it just as if you'd never sinned and can add you to the church. How? The book of Acts tells us how. Uh, you hear the word, you've heard it today in this program. Mm -hmm. You know the gospel. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If you do, then that's the way to, to be saved because it leads you to the steps that lead you to salvation. Right. But if you don't believe, you'll be condemned, John 3, 18, and you'll die in your sins, John 8, 24. And then to repent of your sins as all men everywhere have been commanded to do, Acts 17, 30. And the goodness of God makes you want to repent, Romans mm -hmm. 2, 4. And then I confess His sweet name unto salvation, Romans 10, 9, and 10. And then as a penitent, confessing believer, I'm baptized into Christ to put on Christ, Galatians 3.27, cleansed by the blood of Christ, Acts 22.16, added to the church of Christ, Acts 2.47. Now I get to live for Christ so that someday I get to live with Christ. That's really what it's all about. Yes, it is. And B.J., we, we've talked about Paul in this program a number of times. And you know, Paul in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, talked about Christ. He said, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so if we can just somehow come to that understanding and then as you said, obey the gospel of Christ, be in Christ, live with Christ one day, what a great thought. Amen. Thank you for being with us. Hope to see you back here next week. Until then, God bless. Thine the glory, revive us again.